Good morning, good afternoon everyone, and welcome to this brand new series of videos, the Game Dev Programming Challenges. Today for the first episode, I'm gonna record my own Pong game, but in less than 30 minutes. So for this challenge, I'm gonna have three constraints. First, I'll be using Unity and C Sharp. Then I'll only have 30 minutes starting from a blank, clean Unity project. And finally, I can't use any exterior resource or previously written code, so I'll have to do everything from scratch. I really hope you are gonna enjoy this format. Feel free to tell me what you think in the comments down below, and also share all the ideas that you could have for other game dev challenges for the next episodes. Now, before we dive in, let's just talk a bit about the game so that we're all on the same page. Pong is one of these games from the beginning of video games that everybody has heard of once in their life. It's basically one of the first sport video game ever. Originally released as an arcade game in 1972, the game quickly became famous and it got ported to the living rooms. So the concept of Pong is actually pretty simple. You have two players that each control a paddle and that each have one half of the screen. These paddles can only move up or down, and the goal, just like in real table tennis, is to hit the ball that's going through the field so that it doesn't get behind you, and that it instead exits the screen at the other end, so behind your opponent. If you do manage to get the ball out behind your opponent, then you're gonna get one point and the ball will get reset in the middle. I will be making a single keyboard two players game here, so I'll be giving the left player the W and S keys and the right player the up and down arrow keys to move their paddle. Also, because of the time constraint, I'm gonna adapt the rules a bit. So first, I won't actually implement the win game over part. Instead of stopping at 11 points like in the original Pong game, I'm just gonna keep my version running forever. Also, I'll put the ball spawning point in the middle of the screen. Uh, rather than have it uh, go up and down the screen depending on the turn. And finally, even though it's not very realistic, but because I think it makes for something a bit more challenging, I'm gonna say that the ball has a random angle when it's reset, so it's gonna have a random velocity and you won't know for sure which way it's headed. So you're gonna have to react quickly depending on whether it's headed your way or your opponent's way. And just a little note about the elements I'll need in my Unity scene. So in addition to the ones that are visible and directly used by the player, like the paddles, the ball, or the net in the middle, I'll also need to have some invisible util borders to constrain the ball to the camera view at the top and the bottom, and to easily know if the ball has exited left or right. So, as we'll see soon, I'll have to create some border objects outside of my camera view to act as walls or trigger areas. And with all this info out of the way, let's actually get to the challenge part of this video. Okay, so I'm in my brand new and clean Unity project. It has 2D settings because I want to use an orthographic camera. And with that said, we are a go. Okay, the first thing I'm going to do is populate the scene with the different elements we talked about before. So let me just drag this game view down so that I have a preview of what it's going to look like. And I'm also going to take this opportunity to go for black background. And so now I can just start and add some sprites. So those are 2D elements and I'm going to stretch those. So this is the net in the middle and I want it to span across the entire height. So it's, yeah, it's 10. Um, I can also create um, the paddles this way. So I'm going to have the left paddle that is um, stretched like 0.3 and 1. Yeah, maybe maybe 1.5. And this I want to place on the left somewhere around here. So that looks like minus 8. And on the other side, I want to have the right paddle that's symmetrical. So it's at... Um, plus 8 on the x-axis and now I can also add my ball in the middle so this time it's going to be a circle and it's a bit big for now so I'm just um, yeah point, point 0.4 seems nice 
Um, finally, I want to add uh, the borders we discussed. So I'm just going to copy one of my panels and use it for my top border. So this needs to span across the entire height, uh, the entire width, sorry, of the screen, and it needs to be out of sight. So the important thing is that I need to change the Y position so that it disappears, but it's really close to the top edge. So something like that, it can actually overshoot a bit, that's not an issue. And I'm going to have the same thing at the bottom. So I just need to move it out of view over here. Okay. And now all of those elements, I actually want to interact with each other, except for the net. Um, so I want those five elements to have the, to have some physics with them, some 2D physics. So I'm going to say that all of those, they have box collider 2D components and that the ball has a circle collider 2D. And the ball, it also needs to have a rigid body 2D component. And that's because I want it to be active and to have a velocity and to move across the scene. It uh, won't just be bouncing things off, it will actually be moving itself. But I don't want it to use the gravity, so here at the gravity scale I need to put to zero. Okay, and the next thing um, I want to make sure of is that the ball doesn't lose velocity when it bounces off things. It needs to keep the same velocity. I want elastic collisions. And so to do this, I'm actually going to create a 2D physics material. So I'm going to go to my assets and here I'm going to create a new 2D physics material 2D that I call bouncy. And that has zero friction and maximal bounciness. And so this I'm going to assign to all of the colliders in my scene for now. So here in the material, I'm going to use this. And this way collisions um, won't affect velocity. They won't uh, have any friction. And so this is going to be really smooth and closer to the initial Pong gameplay. And the last thing I want to take care of is add uh, the left and right borders that won't be colliders. They won't bounce the ball off of them. Um, instead, they're going to be triggers because when the ball enters this area, I want something to happen. Namely, I want the ball to be reset in the middle and the score to be increased for the opponent player. So let me just copy this as border left. And scale it so that um, I can place it left of the screen. And again, I need to make sure I don't see it in the view, but it has to be very close. Okay. Um, so this I want um, to be a collider, but I want to be a trigger. This is important. This will also make sure that um, the sprite doesn't um, reflect the ball when it comes to it. And so on the right, I'm going to have the same thing here. And so now I'm actually ready to start scripting. So let's go back to our project and create a new folder for the scripts. And in this project, I'm going to have um, three scripts. So first, I'm going to have the game manager. That's going to take care of respawning the ball and um, handling the score. Then I'm going to have uh, the paddle manager. And finally, I'm going to have a, a score trigger script. So this is going to be uh, placed on the left and right borders and it's going to react to the um, on trigger enter event. So whenever something um, with a collider enters, this trigger area or this trigger area, I'm going to be able to run some callback code for this. Let's actually start with the paddle manager uh, because um, this is fairly autonomous. Um, so what I want to do is first know whether I'm the left or the right paddle. So with a little boolean, because this is de going to determine um, what my up and down key um, codes are. So basically, uh, if I'm the left paddle, that then my up key is going to be um, 
is going to be W, else it's just going to be the F arrow. And similarly for the down key, it's going to be either S or the down arrow. And so now in my update, I can actually use this. Um, so if my up key is currently being pressed and I want to move up. Else if uh, my down key is being pressed, I want to move down. And so those move up and move down functions, they're just going to change this transform position. So they're going to do a translation of, um, of my object and across the up vector with some speed that I need to determine. And so for now, I don't really know what the right value for this is. Um, so I'm just going to guess something and then test and tweak to get something that's better. Uh, so I'm just going to go for two and see what it does. But I always have trouble um, figuring out the best values. So I usually just try something at first, kind of random, and then tweak it so it works. And for the move down, it's uh, the same thing, except you want to go the other way around. So you want to go minus the up vector. Uh, okay, and so if I try this out, what I want to do is first add uh, the script to the paddles. So both paddles need to have this paddle manager script, but only the left paddle should have the is left trigger on. And now if I run this, uh, so, Okay, so I can actually move my puddles, but they are going way too fast. Okay, uh, so there are two issues. First, the speed is way too high. And second, I can actually overshoot the top and bottom borders of my screen, which I shouldn't be able to do. So let's take care of both those issues at the same time. Um, I'm just going to check what my maximum and minimum um, Y value should be. So if I try and move it just in the scene view, 4.25 looks like a, an interesting value um, for the limit, the Y limit. And so it's symmetrical. So it's going to be um, minus 4.25 the other way. And so now what I want to do is in my script, um, first I want to reduce the speed like way, way down. So I'm going to try something like 0.2. This should be better. And the second thing is here, so in the move up and move down functions, once I've actually assigned my new, um, my new position with the translate, I want to check it doesn't overshoot my limits. So I'm going to say that if my Y position is more than 4.25, then I'm going to reassign it. And remember that in Unity, we can't actually assign um, the position directly. We need to copy it to a vector then modify this vector and then reassign the entire vector all at once. And so it's exactly the same thing for the move down, except we want to check the bottom limit. So that's minus and minus here. And so now if I try this again, it should be better. It should be more controllable because I've reduced the speed and it should stop at the top and bottom edge of the screen. So let's try this out. Okay, so that's actually, yeah, actually that's a bit slow now. So I might increase the speed just a little, uh, but I can actually move both the paddles and they are both constrained to the screen. So that's really great. So I'm just going to say that the speed is going to be 0.3. And now let's move on to moving the ball as well, because for now uh, only the paddles are moving, but I also want to get a random velocity on my ball. So this I'm going to do in my game manager. So here um, I'm going to add a new function that is, um, is going to be public and that is going to initialize the ball. And this is just going to get a random angle and then um, get the current spawning direction and apply it as a velocity to my ball rigid body. So I need a reference to my rigid body 2D here and I'm gonna choose a random angle between uh, 0 and 360 floats and I also need to make sure that this is actually not in degrees but in regions uh, otherwise my computation is going to be a bit crazy and so from that I can deduce the direction 
which is going to use cosinus and sinus uh, to get the corresponding x and y components. So I'm just going to use uh, cosinus here and then sinus here. And actually, I want to control um, the strength of my velocity. So what I'm going to do is say that my velocity, my bone velocity, is this direction normalized first and then remultiplied by a factor that I decide uh, myself. So this way, this is the strength of my velocity. And this is um, way easier to control um, than a random vector man magnitude I would get here. And so this I'm going to call in my start method. And so before I try this, I need to instantiate my game manager somewhere in my scene. So I'm just going to add an empty game object that I call manager, on which I add the game manager script. And in this slot, I need to drag my bone rigid body 2D. And now if I try this out, you see that I do get some velocity on my bone and it bounces off the borders and then it just gets out of the screen. And that's because we are not actually triggering anything when something enters um, this trigger zone. So we prepared the trigger mechanics, um, but we're not using those. And also, before I forget, when I respawn my ball, I want it to be replaced um, at the center of the screen. So here in initialize ball, I also want to say that the ball transform position is um, vector 3.0. And so now let's take care of those triggers. So I'm going to open my score trigger class and remove everything inside it because I'm going to use one of Unity's built-in onTrigger methods. And here I want to use the onTrigger enter 2D. The only condition I can have is with my ball because nothing else is moving. So I don't actually need to check anything. Um, but what I do need is an access to my game manager because what I want to do is call the initialize ball function we just created. And for now it's in another script, so I can't actually use it. And so to get this access, I'm going to use the singleton pattern. Sometimes uh, people say that it's not the best and it's true that it's a bit like a global variable, so it can get tricky um, on big projects. Uh, here it won't be an issue because we have a very small scale project and so it will be okay. But on larger projects, it, um, it's a bit dangerous because it introduces a lot of dependencies between your scripts and it basically links all your systems together. So it's not always the best and be careful when you use it. Uh, the upside is that it's really fast to implement because now that I've set my instance here, I can just say game manager dot instance dot initialize ball. And so now if I just apply um, on the left and right border, if I just apply my score trigger script and I rerun this, you see that whenever the ball um, gets to the side of the screen, it just um, repops in the middle with a random velocity. Now, here we see an issue that we can have with the way I've defined my angle. I've said that it can be everything uh, between 0 and 360, which means it can also be a vertical line. And so you just get infinite bouncing in the middle. And that's just not cool. So instead, what would be better? is to uh, change our initialize ball function to constrain this angle to some values that are interesting. So here, what I'm going to do is that I only want to go, for example, between 0 and 30. But then I also want um, some randomness to it so that um, it can go from the top right direction to the top left or the bottom left or the bottom right. Um, so basically, this is just going to be with um, a float, so a random float that I take uh, between 0 and 1. And if this float is less than 0.25, for example, I want to say that it's, uh, so that's this symmetrical direction um, compared to the y-axis. Uh, then if 
my R value is less than 0.5, then um, I'm just going to add 180. And so that's going to take um, the completely opposite direction. So uh, for example, top right is going to become um, bottom left. And finally, if R is less than uh, 0.75, then the angle should be um, 360 minus the angle. And so this is going to be the symmetrical um, compared to the X axis. Um, the important thing is that uh, my matif.dectorad here, this conversion should be done after I've made all of this. So I'm actually going to move this over here and remove it here. And so this way I should avoid um, angles that would make an infinite movement that is just not interesting. Okay, so you see we don't, um, it's, it looks like uh, we don't have um, those weird angles anymore and we can move the paddles and it just respawns. And yeah, we're starting to have some kind of pong game here. Okay, so of course now we want to actually show the score and increase it whenever the ball gets um, out of bounds the other side of you. So you're going to get one point uh, if you're the right player and it goes out the left border, for example. Um, so first, let's add a bit of UI. So I'm going to add text. That is the left score. And I want it to be white and to be a bit bigger, so something like 24, oh, 28. Um, and so I'm going to place this in the middle. Okay. And so I want this to be on the left side and I'm going to copy this to be on the right side. Okay. And so my game manager is going to take care of changing the score. So what I'm going to do as in the game manager, I'm going to add a few variables. So first I'm going to import the unity engine.ui package that I can use text and images and things like that. And I'm going to say that I have a public text that is the score left text and another one that is the score right text. And I'm going to assign those in just a moment. But before I want to uh, prepare my score left and score right variables. And so at the very beginning, of course, those are zero. And then I'm going to have a function that can increase the score. And that just has to know whether it's increasing the left or the right score. And so if it's increasing the left score, then I want a score left to have an increment of one and I want to update the uh, score left text to be this new value as a string and of course else I'm going to do the same but for the right score and this I can actually call in my score trigger uh, so in addition to respawning the ball, I also want um, to increase the score. But again, I need to know whether I'm, I'm increasing the score on the left or the right side. And so I need to know if this is the left or the right border. So if this is the left border, then I want the right score to increase. So I'm going to say that the increase score is going to take the reverse of the, the not is left. Okay, so let's assign all of this in our scene. So first, the border left has to use the is left on for this call trigger script. And then the game manager, it has to know what those texts are. So I'm just going to drag this. And so now if I play this, You see that whenever the ball gets out of view, it either goes through one or the other trigger, and so it increases the corresponding score of the opponent player. So, of course, I can still move and try to stop this ball. 
And now I actually have a pawn game. Of course, could add a lot to this game. And for example, it would be nice that it doesn't start so abruptly. Because for now, when I run the game, um, the ball is already moving. Uh, so I have to react quite quickly if I want to catch the first one. What would be better instead is to have uh, some kind of countdown. Um, actually, since we have a bit of time left, uh, let's take care of that. So I'm going to show you how to create a 3, 2, 1 countdown at the very beginning using coroutines. So we're going to do this in our game manager. And the idea is that we're going to have uh, an I enumerator. So that's to create a coroutine in Unity. Um, it can be private, I don't need to be public. Um, so I'm going to say that this is uh, counting down. And so this is going to do the following. First, it's going to freeze everything uh, so that uh, the ball doesn't move and that everything is just staying still during the countdown. And to do this, I can use the time scale value and put it to zero. And this is essentially going to freeze everything and at the end of course i need to reset um, the time scale to its original value of one so that everything goes back to normal and then in the middle i want to count down and so to count down the idea is that uh, i'm going to add a new ui element a new ui text that i'm going to update and this text uh, is gonna just get the current second countdown and then wait for one second and so on and so on until we reach zero so let's assume that we have a text i'm gonna add it in just a second so we're gonna have the countdown text and what we're gonna do is here we're gonna say that um four in c equals three to c strictly more than zero we want c to decrease and we want the countdown text uh, to actually be C. And then we want to wait for one second. Uh, but because we've uh, changed the timescale to be zero, we can't actually use Unity's in-game time uh, because it will never be uh, passing. So we need to use the real time, uh, the unscaled time. And so we're going to wait one real second. And finally, I want to call this when I start my game. So I'm basically going to initialize the ball. So it's going to have a speed. But remember, we froze everything, so it doesn't really matter. And once I've initialized everything, I'm going to start this coroutine. So I'm going to say, I want to be counting down. And so now, if I add my new UI element, so I'm just going to copy my score element and call it countdown. I'm going to place it in the middle of the screen. And I'm also going to say it's a bit bigger than that. So I'm going to say 40. Okay, so that, that's a, that looks all right. Um, so I'm going to drag this to my game manager. And yeah, before I forget, I also want to actually um, toggle this thing off so that it disappears once the countdown is done. Otherwise, it's just going to be uh, blocking the view in the middle. So here, at the end, when I reset, I also want to say that countdown.text.gameObject set active false. And this way, it's going to be hidden once the countdown is done. Okay, and so if I try and run this now. You see that at the beginning, nothing is happening. We have the countdown and only then does the ball move. So this way is going to be way easier to prepare for the new game, actually. Um, of course, we could uh, improve this a bit by adding some black behind the text. So it's easier to read. Um, so let's do this. I'm just going to add a little panel uh, that is going to be the countdown wrapper. And I'm going to place the countdown inside. This is going to be a simple um, black thing, so don't really care. Okay, and it's going to be quite small. Um, okay, so I'm actually a bit silly. Just going to put some color while I'm 
setting its size. Okay, so this looks all right. Um, now what I want to do is um, hide this object instead of the countdown text, because um, if I don't, then I'm going to be blocking this the entire game. So let's have a reference to this also. And this time I'm directly going to reference the game object. So I'm going to say that this is the countdown wrapper. And this is what I want to turn off when the countdown is done. Um, so all I need to do is assign this here. And now if I run this, it's way more readable. We have a countdown and when the countdown is done, then the ball just gets thrown. And whenever it gets out of bounds, it increases the score, it gets respawned in the middle. And so, yeah, we basically have a Pong game done in less than half an hour. This first game dev challenge was really interesting because it forced me to focus on a little set of features and it allowed me to rediscover some basic Unity concepts like sprites, 2D physics with colliders and triggers, a bit of UI and even some coroutines. I really hope you like this new 2022 series and that you'll stay tuned for other game dev challenges. Again, don't hesitate to tell me what you'd like to see in the comments. And if you want to support my work, you can like and share this video or subscribe to my channel. Also, if you want to discover more of my content, make sure to check out these videos that I made recently. As always, thanks a lot for watching and see you soon for more videos on coding and games.